A couple of people have come and had conversations with me, particularly from the developing countries. And um, the concern is the assumption that internet freedoms are an absolute and don't come with, 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 with the need to address the challenges that internet freedom uh, brings. So let's talk, for instance, about the leaderless revolution that we saw in Egypt. Let's talk about culture um, and the cultural aspects that are challenged in many countries by access to so many different things on the internet and a feeling from some communities that this is a threat and the fear that that builds. Carl, just before we go to the other questions, what are your thoughts on how we start to address this? Is it about capacity building? What are the immediate answers? Well, I, the, the, well, I don't know if there is an immediate answer, but the answer is yes. Um, the internet gives the, the ability to access a lot of things that you were not able to access before. That means that any close society, I'm not necessarily saying that only in a negative uh, sense right. is then suddenly exposed to new things. That is seen as challenging. I mean, you can compare it to a certain extent to the debate that we've had in this country and other countries when it comes to immigration. I mean, Sweden was a country, go back X numbers of decades, and immigrants that didn't exist. Finns. Uh, but that was it. And, and suddenly, during the last 20 years, uh, you have people coming from all over the world. We have 40,000 people from Syria who are refugees. We have people from all corners of the world coming into Swedish society. Some people say, ah, too much. They are foreign, they look different, they speak a funny language, and some of their values might not be identical to what was the case in Sweden in the 19th century. But society is enriched, in my opinion, by that diversity and by that sort of clash between different experiences. We see the same on the net. And uh, although we should have respect for people who sometimes feel that these are coming too fast, we should try to explain that this is the way the world is moving and the diversity and the, that creates creativity is something that over time benefits each and everyone. So you're saying evolution. This e is, this evolution is part and uh, confrontations, yes, uh, but confrontations that, create, that leads to creativity and more dynamic societies. Thank you, thank you for that. Let's go straight well, to the curators. Well, yes, so uh, the, the conversation going in the social networks points at um, a very concrete issue of surveillance. So the concrete question is, in the light of Edward Snowden revelations, does Sweden intercept, store, or analyze in any way the, communication, the communications of millions of individuals? Wow, that's a direct one, Carl. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, but that's, that's what I said. That's the data retention directive, mm -hmm. which all European countries have in Sweden and Sweden. Uh, here we have a difference between the US and the European Union countries. Um, uh, we have a law, the data retention directive, that uh, telecommunication companies, they have to store the metadata information for some time. And then if there is a criminal investigation of some sort, the legal authorities can access that. Uh, and if I talk to police people, they're increasingly, they see this is increasingly important for certain of the types of criminality that we have in Swedish society. The US had a different system, because the US took the metadata into the computers of the NSA. So in the US, they were in the hands of the government. In Sweden and other European countries, they are in the hands of telecommunications companies. They don't particularly like it, by the way, because it's costly for them. And now we have to look at the mechanism of that because the European Court of Justice has uh, sort of thrown out that particular directive. And in the US, I understand they are now discussing to move it from the sort of NSA state model to the European model at the same time as the European model is uh, changing. So saying more and more the police are saying that this information is critical for them, that's interesting to note. Yeah, we, because we have, I mean, uh, we have a lot of cyber Nanjire crime. is laughing, I'll yeah. bring you in on this later, mm. but sorry, please, Carl, go ahead. No, I mean, we have, we have, we have a lot of cyber criminality. I mean, we, we yes. should not, the net is a reflection of society. And most of society is good, nice, and benevolent. But there are elements of society that are less good, less benevolent, and less nice. And those elements on the net as well. And they need to be taken care of there 
as they are in the rest of society. Well, let me bring Chris Painter into this. Tell us about the U.S. mode, which Carl has explained. So uh, as part of the debate, we've had a very robust debate about uh, all of these issues over the past year. And, and I'd say that uh, in that... Uh, in that endeavor, I think Sweden and the U.S. have been very similar. We've had this debate as free societies. Uh, more and more governments, I think, are having these debates. There are some governments that are not having these debates at all, and that's troubling. And those are the governments I think we really uh, need to show concern about. Uh, and even Secretary Kerry, when he, he talked at the uh, Tallinn uh, Internet Freedom Conference, talked about uh, certain principles that guide actions of uh, democracies versus more repressive regimes, including oversight, uh, uh, proper purpose, transparency, etc. Uh, and that's really important. Uh, President Obama, when he gave a major speech not too long ago now, talked about a series of reforms, and one of them was exactly that, to look, about, uh, look at how the data is stored, uh, and that's one of the reforms that, and that is, uh, is underway, and, and thinking about how it's stored, who stores it, and what the implication is uh, of that. Because you do have some competing interests here. You do have to protect your public uh, from a range of different threats, and, and clearly cybercrime is one, but now that uh, evidence is increasingly digital for almost all kinds of crime, you have to be able to access that evidence. But at the same time, you want to have the kind of legal oversight, transparency, uh, and, and rule of law and proper purpose uh, that is necessary in free society. So that, that's the balance we're trying to strike. It's a debate we've been having for the past year. It's a debate that will go on, but I think we really have made some progress, and there's a huge difference between uh, what the U.S., Sweden, and, and other countries do uh, and what uh, uh, some countries who uh, uh, increasingly, and one of the stories you know, over the last couple of days has been a great discussion, but there have been many stories of governments who are uh, not having a debate about that, but a debate about how you can more uh, effectively censor your own citizens, how you can find ways to prevent them from communicating. Uh, and that's one of the big challenges we face as this world becomes divided between the countries who are trying to do that because they're worried, as, as Carl said, uh, they use this term cultural uh, sensitivity often as a code because they're worried about the destabilizing nature of, of speech. And, and that, uh, they're worried about dissent and they try to prevent dissent by shutting down these networks and that's really a problem and that's something we have to really bind together and fight. Thank you so much. Let's, let's take uh, questions from the floor now. Please let me see your hands go up. I see there's a lady over there in the, I think a blue, in a blue jumper. There's another lady at the back with a pink scarf. If we could get the mics to them. Um, yes, I see you there as well. Thank you. Please tell us your name and tell us what you do and as briefly as possible, pose your question or make your comment. Sure, so my name is Courtney Rajan with the Committee to Protect Journalists and quite unsatisfied by the answer um, and the response from the U.S. Um, representative trying to deflect criticism to other countries regarding what they're doing to censor their citizens. I think that the NSA mass surveillance has had a widespread impact on self-censorship, um, not only among the general public, but among journalists in particular. And I'd like you to address specifically what sort of commitments the U.S. can make to not um, censor, not engage self-censorship um, through mass surveillance and what they can do to protect journalists in particular, given that James Risen, for example, is on trial, given that there have been um, double the amount of uses of the Espionage Act um, under this administration. And with respect to Sweden, I think we need to understand a little bit more about what role you can play in helping your allies to be better stewards of net freedom. Thank you, thank you for that. The lady at the back in the, in the, in the pink scarf, please, go ahead. Yes, hi, I'm Sarah Cortez from uh, CCTV in Cambridge and the Tor Project. And um, we've benefited a lot during this forum in connecting organizations who are interested in helping to provide technology training and education to women and girls to advance their employment opportunities in training and education. And we're interested in hearing the panelists' advice on how we can continue to work to empower women and girls economically through technology. Thank you for that. There's a gentleman over here at one of the tables in the middle. Yes. Um, if we can take the mic to him. Meanwhile, the lady on this side can go ahead. Thank you. Please stand up. Yes. Oh. Hi. My question is for Carl Bildt. Um, so you've been speaking about the seven principles, and I really appreciate that, that you seem to take into consideration that surveillance and privacy is worth both being respected and regulated. Because last year at the last SIF, 
you said that privacy had never hurt anyone as long as people didn't know about it. And so that's an interesting change. And I'm wondering to what extent the Snowden revelations have you know, been impacting that change, especially now that we know that in Pakistan, metadata do kill. Uh, so I'm wondering, you know, in light of all that, would you consider uh, granting Edward Snowden asylum? Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So oh. let's address those questions, then I'll come to the gentleman. You've got the mic, I see, so we'll come to you in just a moment. Um, let me start with Chris. So um, you've been asked uh, what commitments can the U.S. make on censorship? How can you protect journalists? So, so the U.S. and President Obama has been clear that we do not use surveillance. We use surveillance to protect our citizens, and frankly, not just our citizens, but many citizens around the world. And that we do it in a way that we do it in a way that is not it does not target uh, people for uh, expressing their religious views or their political views. And and what Secretary Kerry laid out, well, first of all, what President Obama laid out in his speech is that before we go to his speech, I think you know there's a clear indication and feeling that the attitude that the U.S. takes towards this is is the word hypocritical. Now, you know, so look, look, I think, I get, that's I, I, I think, I think, but I think, I think that's been part of the narrative and I, I would dispute that narrative. I think what we've seen is, I think people have to understand there's a legitimate purpose in protecting citizens from various harms. Now, how you get that balance right, that's something we should debate and that's a debate that we've had in our country and it's a debate that when President Obama gave the speech, not only to say that we should not simply do things because we can do them, which I think was very important, uh, but also we were going to work to take into account the privacy rights, not just of U.S. citizens, but of citizens around the world. And then uh, you couple that with some of the reforms that have been put in place since then and uh, what Secretary Kerry said about you know, some of the basic principles that are guiding us going in the future and some of the things we've done in terms of disclosing FISA opinions, etc. This is an ongoing uh, discussion but it's a discussion that we're having and a discussion that we should have. And I'm not at all trivializing that issue. I think it's important we've had this discussion over the last year and it's a discussion we're going to continue to have. What I, what I was saying is that you, you can't allow that to uh, be the fodder for regimes who want to have a totally different vision of the Internet, who want to impose more state control, who want to fragment the Internet, and they really have uh, the purpose of restraining the free flow of information and speech on the internet. You know, we have to think, we have to keep our eyes on the prize. We have to keep our eyes on the shared goals that we have while having legitimate debates that we've been having both in our country and around the world. Legitimate debates, and I think honest self-analysis is what we need. Um, Carl, let, let me bring you in here, and the question to you was, how can Sweden better advise allies and other governments that you work with, but, but also you've been asked, you know, have you changed your perspective, or you've changed your perspective on privacy issues, what, what occasioned that? No, and then I got the question on Snowden and asylum as well, mm, that's, um, yeah, that's and uh, <laughs> if, if I remember it rightly, and, and that question has been sorted out already, because we have, we have among most countries, and certainly within Europe, um, legally, I'm not quite certain it applies to Russia, but I mean it applies to legal politically to have the first country of asylum. Um, the first country you go to and apply for and get asylum, that's what applies. And then you can't apply anywhere else. And why he went to Russia, of all places, is not for me to judge. Uh, but he has been granted asylum by the country where he decided to seek asylum. And that sort of ends that particular story in, in the rest of countries, according to principles that are there. In, in Europe and the way that uh, we did deal with these particular issues. You uh, you change your mind about rebellion. Sorry? That no. was the, the about yeah no I'm I'm I'm, the I'm, I'm coming he, to that. He will he will answer. Let's yeah. give him a moment. No, because I mean we've had we've had this debate for uh, <laughs> Snowden was a latecomer. Uh, we've had this debate in Sweden well before that. Uh, both the extensive debate on our, which I think I've spoke about here before, the, our telephone tapping, because we do, I mean, the mega, metadata thing is only metadata, but it has to be uh, fair, and I think I've explained it before, we have the right also to go in to listen to the content of a telephone call on internet communication. But that requires very specific court orders, and that has been there for ages and is reported and controlled by parliament and legal authorities and whatever, and I think it applies to virtually every country. Sweden is unique in the sense that we have very open and transparent laws 
and we have discussed it also when it comes to the foreign intelligence activities. But important to make the point, it wasn't a question to me, but to the US, uh, on censor. We, I mean, this is a country that censors nothing, even things that are legally not, uh, that are criminal. We don't censor them. We, uh, we can bring them to court afterwards if they've done it, but we never censor in advance. I think we have probably the strongest freedom of speech tradition in our constitution of any country in the world. I mean, there are countries that, for reasons that I can understand, says that it is not allowed to question the Holocaust. I mean, Sweden is open to loonies uh, and all sorts of people, um, without going into specific on who's who. Uh, but <laughs> there are cases when we can then bring them to court afterwards. And we do have also law that we can go in and sort of go into telephones and we can go into communication, but it's very strict. Uh, the cases that is done, the number of cases reported to Parliament each year and under very strict laws. Then, helping other countries. The Freedom Online Coalition is meant to do that. Uh, where we have brought together, uh, uh, we and we, I started with the Dutch as well, uh, has to be said. Um, we brought together countries from around the world who are uh, united in this particular approach. And uh, we spend quite some time trying to reach out to other countries to enlarge the membership. And I said it was the Estonians who have a sort of impeccable and very good record on this particular issue. It's now the Mongolians. And then we work at the Human Rights Council, as I mentioned, with these different resolutions. And we're also very open in criticizing even friends. I consider Turkey to be a friend. But uh, even friends, when they uh, violate the, the principles that we consider sacrosanct in these respects. And, and I, I should just say that the Freedom Online Coalition is expanded now to 23 countries from around the world and, and from all regions of the world. And the, the purpose is to expand it still further because one of the things that came out of the recent meeting in Tallinn, which happened right after the meeting in Brazil, so that was a good counterpart of those two meetings, uh, was subscribing to a set of principles there that talked about the full range of issues in cyberspace, including multi-stakeholder governance, and it's really important to get countries to sign on to that. And I just say, as far as our First Amendment protections, uh, uh, many people, uh, we, we, have a we have similar, uh, uh, very uh, expansive uh, views of, of First Amendment and, and in terms of uh, expression, uh, and our, our basic view is you fight speech you don't like with other speech. <laughs> Let me come to the journalist over here because um, it, would be, it would be key to get your views on this whole discussion. What is your assessment of where we need to go in terms of internet freedom? And who's, uh, you know, is there a country that you would highlight as, as, as a benchmark or, or a, a country that has adopted best practice? Any ideas on which way forward? Andre, it's start. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm... I feel myself in a very peculiar situation because well, Russia provided asylum for Mr. Snowden. And uh, I would say that, <coughs> well, of course, Russia is, uh, is not, uh, it's not a country which might be proud of uh, freedom of expression and freedom of press, especially um, over the last two years uh, we witnessed uh, many new repressive measures, um, uh, which is mostly aimed to deal with uh, the freedom online. And I should say that the biggest the biggest challenge we are facing now is, um, is the way how the Russian government found a way how to deal with global platforms in Russia. And I would say that the biggest challenge we are facing with uh, is, um, is localization. Uh, when I type uh, Google uh, at home uh, in Moscow, uh, it goes to google.ru not because of, uh, of the government pressure, but because uh, Google wants me to go to the local page. Mm -hmm. And uh, this provokes the governments uh, to work very closely with, uh, uh, with global platforms to, to pressure them, because it uh, seems to be very convenient. And, and maybe it's convenient, but I think it's, uh, I found it quite a a bit crazy that the Russian search engine Yandex now presents two different maps of Ukraine with or without Crimea for the Ukrainian and Russian audience uh, respectively. <laughs> I think it's, it's a bit strange to me. And I think we, we need Is to... Is that what's called diplomacy? Ma that <laughs> maybe, but I don't quite understand why, this why Yandex as a search engine should be involved in this kind of uh, right. diplomacy. And uh, we see uh, that sometimes the governments found a way how to put on 
put pressure on global platforms and get response almost immediately. We got the system of uh, internet filtering in Russia uh, since 2012, and it was introduced in November of 2012. And already by April, all three companies, Facebook, Google, and Twitter, became much more cooperative with Russian authorities. And just last example of last week, uh, one Russian official uh, heavily criticized Twitter uh, for being not cooperative with the Russian authorities, and he threatened that the whole of Twitter would be blocked entirely in Russia. Mm -hmm. The next day, Twitter blocked uh, the access uh, for the private sector, uh, which is a very anti-Russian uh, political group based in Ukraine, for the Russian audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that it provokes for the, for the, uh, the authorities uh, of countries like Russia to to go further in terms of censorship, because it would be not a global plot for, uh, global problem. It would be pr the problem only for these particular countries. Let's move from the journalist to the researcher. You've done some very interesting research on censorship, Nanjira. What are your findings? Um, so f most, mostly what we've done is around hate speech, which has been a problematic issue in Kenya. Um, and um, the framework we've used has also been tried out um, in neighboring Ethiopia, for instance. Um, what is really interesting about where Kenya is positioned in East Africa is probably the only country that can say it has internet freedom. And this is not by de design, really, it's by default. Um, but now this, there's that need to sort of like come down upon it. And so we've had to find a body of work to show, to make a case for, um, you know, self-regulation on the internet um, as is happening in the Kenyan space. Um, what's really interesting is just to see um, even at the African, African Union level, the kind of laws that are being proposed to deal with uh, cyber security. So that's why I find it very interesting when it's mentioned that cyber security and freedom of expression are suddenly being married together mm -hmm. through legislation so that one will then make it okay to oppress the other. Mm -hmm. And so this is what we are trying to fight back using a body of evidence to say that, you know what, yes, cyber crime is an issue, but it should not then look at legislation from a point of also um, holding back on freedom of expression. Because what we're seeing, at least in Kenya, is that over time people self-regulate to a point where they own that space themselves. And this is really opening up the country to a point where cohesion, something that we've been talking about for 50 years, has happened much faster in the last four years because people are online, they fight, they, they um, never see each other eye to eye again, or they come to a, body, a, a, a common understanding. Yeah. But this has been happening without the intervention of any actors. People know how to uh, mark out propagandists from the government, from the opposition, or from any other forces. Mm -hmm. And so over time, what we're seeing is, through collecting that body of evidence, we can make a case for the fact that this um, tying of cyber security, uh, cyber crime issues with freedom of expression laws should, not be, should be disentangled. Yeah. That, that, that's fascinating, and I'm sure there are people here who'd want to, to access that research. You can get hold of Nanjira for that. Mm. Let's go to the Myanmar situation. It cannot be easy fighting for the freedom of expression in, 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 in a country that is really trying to progress mm. at this point. It's, it's really had its challenges so far. What's your experience been so far? Well, um, coming from a country that has 5% internet penetration rate and taking five minutes for Google homepage to load to a country with internet penetration rate of, uh, I think, nearly 95% and with a very, very fast internet, make me, you know, stun. And, uh, and I'm, I'm from uh, developing, you know, countries where sometimes access seems to be much less important than um, food and security problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, where the government, at least ours, thinks that internet freedom is a first world problem <laughs> and surveillance is a norm because even countries like America is doing that. So, uh, so it's, it's really, I mean, getting hard for us to um, fight for this freedom of expression mm. offline and also online because, because of this, um, um, the, the countries that we benchmark did. Right, so uh. we, you, you'd be saying we need some kind of cooperation, yep. we need to see some people who are making that freedom work in their environments and, mm -hmm. and even as you struggle for that space. Um, Gayathri, let me, let me come to you now. We've just heard what's happened in Thailand, so it's, it's a highly volatile situation, environment you're working in. What are your thoughts on this whole idea of censorship and how to address it? Um, I think with uh, you know, the developments in, in uh, many countries in Southeast Asia, um, I for one think that the, um, it's actually interesting to hear a lot of talk about how 
uh, freedoms offline need to be taken uh, to the online space as well. But I think it's on the assumption that the freedoms offline are there yes, and, yes. and actually uh, appreciated. So I think that maybe of the, the, the bet of actually forums like this and, and uh, the global debate about internet governance and internet freedom is to actually bring back some of the old issues. Right. And these old issues we have heard in the last two days, you know, it's blasphemy, it's sedition, it's um, uh, all kinds of other, uh, other threats as well. So I think that there's actually a fantastic opportunity mm -hmm. to bring back some of these issues that somehow got dropped or are very, very inconvenient for governments. I think you are also inconvenient when we talk about uh, Snowden, you know, we, it's, it's, it's come up uh, quite a lot. It's not a dead, dead horse yet because I think that for me, coming from Southeast Asia, from the media, Snowden was very important in this forum because it actually allowed us to look at the interaction between uh, issues of surveillance, issues of net governance, and media freedom. Uh, I think it really provided, it would have provided uh, an opportunity to actually bring those issues and talk about what is actually holding back a lot of disclosure, a lot of um, access to information in countries like in, in Southeast Asia. So, you know, uh, Tak Tak says, you know, access is down, but access to information is a, a crucial problem. So I, for one, think that the, the discussion about uh, online threats gives us an opportunity to go back and unpack some of the old issues. So you talk about censorship. Well, it's censorship, it's becoming more sophisticated. It's going into every spaces that people have um, uh, access to. Uh, and I think it's playing out in, in a lot more dangerous ways uh, than before. The good thing about that is that I think people are pushing back. Chris wants to come in. I know, Carl, we need to release you in a moment. So I just want to get your no. feedback from the panelists. But also, a question was uh, asked about the training for girls oh. and women, which is critical. So if you'd address that, please, as well, before you go. No, ab absolutely. I mean, we have um, X numbers of digital divides in the world that we must try to bridge. One is the geographic one. There's a gender one. And there's an age one. I mean, you can say there's a digital divide inside every family in the world today between the older generation who don't understand what's going on and the younger generation who don't understand that the older generation don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think it's important. We devote, uh, we have lots of programs in supporting the gender issues around the world. Uh, this forum is a way of supporting also bridging the geographical divide. And I think the, uh, the age thing will be taken care of by itself. <laughs> <laughs> it, it will happen. It will happen. Uh, Thanks. Any further comments before you leave us? Unfortunately, I, I have to leave. Uh, for I, I, I wish I could say that I'm going to see the king or the prime minister or some important meeting. No. But my son has really insisted that I should be on this particular performance that he's going to do at his school at the end of the year. So I as, as, as a mom, I, I, yes, I, I think that kudos, kudos to you. Thank you for being with us for Thank this you. time. Chris, I did see your hand up there for a moment. You wanted to come in. Please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, just on the, the issue of cybersecurity, one of the things we, we pointed out um, in, uh, the, uh, in Talent and the Freedom Online Coalition and some of those principles that if you do cybersecurity right, that really can enable uh, the free expression on the Internet. And, and it should not be a proxy uh, for uh, repression, for targeting dissidents. Uh, and it all, it all too often is. And we've heard some of those stories in the last few days. And I think that... One of the things you've seen is there are some countries that don't use the term cybersecurity, which means really protecting networks, but they use the term information security, mm -hmm. and that means they're trying to control information. They're worried about destabilizing speech. And the worrisome thing is, you know, there are some repressive regimes, you're not going to change their minds, at least not in the short term. But there are a lot of countries in the middle, there are a lot of countries in the f on the fence who are worried about stability, but they're also worried about their social development, their economic development. So this, this links to uh, the, the title of this conference uh, for global development and, and capacity building, one of the things that I think it's incumbent on all of us to do uh, is to really reach out to the developing world and make the case that this open system, this open internet and, and security that enables and doesn't prevent expression uh, is something that is good for their economies uh, because that drives a lot of developing world uh, you know, countries as they make decisions and their societies and that's something that ties very closely to capacity building. I'm going to um, Botswana uh, next week to do a, uh, for the Southern African countries to do some capacity building that's more focused on the security side, but we also embed some of these uh, messages about freedom of expression, making sure you don't use one to, to uh, hamper the other, 
uh, and this idea of, uh, of a multi-stakeholder partnership, you bring others in. Now, let me just throw in this word, and I, I just want a brief response from each of you on this, if you could share your views. Um, I'm just going to say the word radicalization. Internet freedom and radicalization. Where's the balance? Chris, I'll start with you and go around. If you well, just well, you know, as, as I said earlier, we have a very expansive view of internet freedom in the United States. And even if speech is very, 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 very distasteful, we allow it to happen. And our, our view is the way you combat that speech is with more speech. You don't prevent that speech from happening. And right. so that's been a long held view. Uh, other, other countries have different views on this, but I think we want to promote as much expression as we can. We don't want to hamper that expression. I should say one other thing, because I, I, before I forget, on women and girls, uh, that's been a priority for uh, our secretary for a long time. We have a, uh, a coordinator uh, for uh, uh, global women's issues, and this is something that we feel very strongly about across the board, but also in this area. Okay. Uh, tai Tai, let me come to you. The issue of radicalization, but also the all-important issue of gender and, and how to empower, equip, to train women and girls as well. Your thoughts? <laughs> well, um, I think I have to look into the word radicalization, <laughs> into the Extre dictionary. <laughs> extremism, okay. just, just the spread of extremist ideologies. On the internet. Yes, oh. yes. Well, um, that's the case that's happening right now in Myanmar because, uh, because, um, because in Myanmar, um, although there isn't you know, very much internet user comparing to other countries, I including the neighbors, um, people really, I mean, use Facebook, I mean, for example, Facebook a lot, and Facebook has become a hotbed for extremism, so uh, including religious extremism and uh, uh, yep. So how do you think it should be? And there are no mechanisms yet, as you said, to kind of decisively. And and this. it's becoming a, actually a a, a a bad trend for people because because of that people are thinking that internet freedom is kind of this Western thing that that we shouldn't have it in our country yet. Okay, so it, it brings negative impressions yes. of what uh -huh. internet freedom uh -huh. is. W what are your thoughts on, in your environment, how best to grow capacities mm -hmm. uh, among women and young girls in terms of use of the internet? Well, um, I think um, in, in, in the context of a country, um, civil society as well as the, um, the other stakeholders will have to take a, take a part in, uh, in uh, creating spaces for minorities and women to go safely online. Mm -hmm. So, and, and also I think that um, in, in this way, um, telecom operators will also be, you know, have a big, big role in, you know, in uh, cooperating with especially the civil societies in the country in ensuring these kinds of spaces and being transparent with us. Great. So creating awareness. And, yep. and, and mm -hmm. all. Andre, please, your, your uh, thoughts. Well, I think uh, there was a British uh, historian, Christopher Hill, who said that we got most of our radical ideas, we still didn't today, including communism, uh, from the time of the English Civil War just because then there was a very brief period of complete freedom of press and printing was very cheap. Actually, everybody might print something and, well, we got radical thinking, but at the same time it helps the society to develop new ideas about what to, do, what to do with the society. Unfortunately, it seems to me that this period on the internet is uh, coming to the end. And I think maybe we got all radical ideas we already can get from, from the internet. Uh, but nevertheless, so I think generally uh, the society uh, benefits from, from radical thinking. Society benefits from radical thinking, or the debate around radical and thinking, maybe. Okay, yeah, not sure I, I, mean, I see where he's going with that. Um, uh -huh. No, I think what we see online, at least in the Kenyan context, is really an extension of what's already happening offline okay. in terms of radicalization. And so the internet this becomes a place to amplify something, to just make this message known. I mean, in the case of how we've seen with Al-Shabaab as a threat group in Kenya, what we've seen is they're going online is to make a point that we're not just doing this undercover, that we want you to know that we are radicalizing. Now, it's always very difficult to tie um, an act or a call to action like that to any action that actually happens, um, online or offline for that matter. And so I wouldn't say there's a direct causation or correlation link here to be drawn. It's just that um, we have to remember that just the same way that, um, technology is not a panacea, the internet is not then to be blamed for everything that goes on it. You know, The same way there will be a message about whatever is deemed good to some people will be amplified, is the same way radicalization will be amplified. Now, on the issue of women and ICT, um, step one, 
uh, I think I've found is we have to applaud all the women who are already using these spaces because they are fighting battles that have already just extended from offline. Um, we see women who have to bear through um, just being attacked by just virtue of being a woman online. And that in itself, they are doing the first work of laying the ground and making it possible for more women to come online. They're making it more possible uh, because they're also demanding this. The other thing is just to make it a choice so that we're not always, um, you know, genderizing everything, you know. Um, I get a bit frustrated when we have to say now everything is something women, women end. Gender end, mm. you know? Mm. Can we finally make some things equal access from the get go and so we can move beyond genderizing everything? Right, yeah. right. I hear you. Please, your thoughts on that. So, right. can I turn it around and say that I think fighting for freedom has become the radical idea <laughs> and the standards have gone so low <laughs> that, uh, you know, when you say that, um, um, you know, access to information is our right. Wow, that sounds radical in countries like Malaysia, in, in Burma. Mm. So, I think that the standards have dropped so low as to what um, the notions of freedom are and what you can fight for. So I'm turning it around because I know that, yes, a lot of um, uh, radical views have been dominating the, the online sites and everything. But then it also becomes convenient when we focus so much on these kinds of um, radicalization online, forgetting that it has roots offline. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes convenient that you want to tackle it online, but then not actually um, deal with it in to, the real world. Yeah. Exactly. But, uh, but for me, radicalization is actually just to say it is my freedom to and it's my right to do something. That in many countries has become actually a radical idea. And, so and, and you can challenge, you can challenge those radical views online. You don't have to sit silent while they're out there. And, Absolutely. And even in the U.S., you know, not everything is fair game. If you're out there trying to plan an attack, for instance, uh, where there's imminent harm, or you're uh, doing material support for terrorism, that's not allowed. So not everything is fair game either. But the question often is, what is radical and what's not? That's right. No, I'm just. I'm but Gayathri is saying, I'm a radical. I'm a radical for freedom. That's what you're kind saying. of. Yeah, but I. I I think that you know it's to assume that everyone has the same access to that in order to challenge and that's not true so mm. i think that mm. uh you know taking into account that uh to say that the space itself will you know moderate itself is is i think it's flawed no? because you, you'd still have to go back and see where who are the 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 ones attacked by some of these radical ideas but you know i, I really want to push it to say that you know i think freedom is a radical idea rather than yeah, I think yeah. that's an interesting point you've just made as well. And, and, but let, let's take a few more questions. The gentleman there, sorry, I've kept you waiting. Please do stand up. Thank you. So uh, I'm Sasha. Uh, I'm with Greenhost. I'm also just a concerned citizen. Uh, I'm very concerned because we have had, like the internet has existed for some time and it has been multi-stakeholder all along. And actually, it were the governments who came in late to this whole multi-stakeholder thing and trying to take this over. So, and I have been really, 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 really disappointed with, uh, with what that led to, especially with states uh, uh, taking over the whole narrative about uh, 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 cyber security and how uh, this is modeling what we're talking about. Um, I think uh, we should look more into how states can protect citizens and uh, how the responsibility to protect, as is well known uh, a, as a mechanism in international law, should also apply to the internet and to protecting individual citizens and not uh, abstract threats uh, that would allow for some reason to spy on everyone. But because, as was said, yeah, you do not uh, target people when you're looking at them. And I think that's one of the major problems. Thank so, you. So we'll put, that, we'll put that to the panel. There are two gentlemen here in the middle, one in the gray shirt and one at the back in a jumper. Can we see them at the back? I see some questions here. Yes, please go ahead. You seem to have the mic next to you. The lady will start here as you give the gentleman the mic. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, Mr. Bilt has left, but um, this forum is conspicuous by the absence of the people who are actually responsible for us having this debate. And I do not know why they are not here, whether it's Greenwald, whether it's Jacob Applebaum or Snowden. But I'm sure that that would have made the debate much richer. Uh, coming from a developing country, access and uh, women and everything has been great. Um, to the US representative here, what do I tell my constituency, whether it's women or people who want to come online, that there is a tool which has been used 
as a tool for the processes of totalitarianism. That is what you should be using by which in the guise of free speech and expression, every move of your will be surveilled about which you will have no Fourth Amendment right and you will have no say. So in this, with this argument of free speech, which we would really like, and if it were possible, I would take the First Amendment of US Constitution all over the world, it becomes very, very difficult for us now to keep uh, following the narrative which you're trying to sell us in uh, light of the surveillance which has been carrying out on the net. Thank you. Thank you for that question. The two gentlemen at the back, and then there's a lady here at the front. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Jacob Dexa. I'm from the Swedish think tank Forest. Uh, people will probably do not like what I'm saying right now. Given that we have a need for surveillance, how can we increase the trust in those mechanisms which are in their nature secret? Um, how can we increase the trust in such organizations, actions and methods that we can't really dwell into ourselves? Thank you for that. So, uh, gentleman behind, right at the back. Um, where is the other mic, please? There's a lady here at the front. Just... Thank you, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask, uh, how, how do you apply the principles of necessity and proportionality to um, the legitimate use of mass surveillance? And uh, what would the U.S.'s position be, U.S. government's position be, if another country conducted mass surveillance on U.S. citizens for legitimate reasons? Thank you. Wow, thank you. Chris, you've got a lot of questions coming in for you. I hope you're getting ready. I'm going to take one more question, this lady at the front, and then we'll yeah, come to the panel. My name is Sana Salim, and I'm uh, from reportedly the second most surveilled country uh, by the NSA, <laughs> Pakistan. Um, and again, a uh, similar question. Uh, but the U.S. has been has a lot of aid promised to Pakistan. A lot of development aid is coming in that's been given to civil society as well as um, you know, the government has been doing some of the work that it's been doing is great. And some of the programs that the US government, the State Department has been running in Pakistan focus heavily on fighting surveillance, fighting um, for free speech. So question, my question is, how does the US reconcile with the fact that it is supporting groups in Pakistan to fight against surveillance uh, by government uh, and is surveilling the citizens of Pakistan at the same time. Um, uh, it's shameful that all the reactions that came post um, Snowden, um, it seemed that the US is the only country in the world whose citizens actually have the right. We don't exist. Um, so how do you reconcile that? And my, the second part of the question is that, uh, which is also fairly a comment but a short one, is that when I stand here and ask you that question, I'm not being anti-American. Uh, what happened, what the NSA did was crimes in the name of the American people and the American government and the American values that you stand for that a lot of people consider benchmarks. It's, it's done a huge damage to US credibility. What is the US government genuinely doing to take back that credibility and that credibility also impacts us, all of us, all over the world. Because so when we speak out, we are told, you need to shut up and sit back because if the US citizens can't have it, so can't you. Thank, Thanks. Thank you for that question. So Chris, you, you've, you've got quite a few and I think they're interrelated. But, but let me just make this point as you address the question. Just recently at a global leadership program in Harvard, one of the American lecturers made this presentation about America's role as the protector of the good society, of freedoms, of democracy. The reaction from participants was, I think, unexpected. The feeling is, I think, growing across the world that you're not aligned to what you seem to stand up for, that indeed this role of big brother in many ways no longer exists, that do you as the US have the moral authority to take that position? So I think you know, all these questions are coming on the backdrop of those kinds of feelings, you know, a, a growing perspective. I hand over to you now yeah. to, so, to address so, them. So I mean, uh, you know, look, I, I, again, not trivializing the issue, but the fact is how many countries have had the kind of debate that we've had in the last year? How many countries have had their president stand up and say, here are some of the things that we're going to do and we're going to commit to do, which is an ongoing process because it involves both the executive and the legislative branch. How many countries have said, we, you know, we want to 
uh, live by certain principles and enunciated those principles as we did, as Secretary Kerry did. I mean, th there is a real distinction when you're talking about rule of law, legitimate purpose. We've made a lot of the FISA decisions public, which is, I think, a, a, something that's never been done before in terms of transparency in the U.S. Uh, and, and oversight, and really looking at this through studies the president commissioned uh, and independent studies. I mean, this is not something that we're, take, we're treating as at all trivial, but... The, I think the, the question, the just, and I'm sorry to do this, Chris, but I think the, the, the question is, there's a lot of talk there's a lot of studies and research, I'm sure, but are you aligned in your actions? Yes, I mean, and, and that's exactly where it's going. I mean, I think that we're saying, here are the, here are the principles we're going to live by, and, and people should hold us accountable for those principles, and we're going to do this. And it's uh, changed the way we, uh, we look at this information. It has to be a particular purpose. I mean, the president himself said we shouldn't do something simply because we can. A lot of ways the technology got ahead of the way that we looked at these issues. And, and I think that that's been a robust debate in the U.S., and, and, and it's engaged a lot of the people around the world. And we just had the Podesta report, which talked about big data, which is another aspect of all of this, which is not surveillance, uh, but it's another aspect of how you balance privacy and some of the, the, the innovation and, and, uh, uh, and economic aspects of the larger data sets that are out there. So these, there, there has been a lot of not just talk, but I think action, and that's going to continue. What I, what I really go back to, though, because, uh, you know, there's been so much that's happened this year that's been positive, too, including that Monday all, that if we lose sight of what the various visions of this ecosystem could look like, if we focus only on this, and I'm not saying this is not important, but if we focus only on this to the exclusion of saying, how are we going to have the Internet governed? Are we going to have a multi-stakeholder system? Are we going to have a government system? Are we going to have an open system? Are we going to have a fragmented system uh, which is really designed to control content? Those are huge issues that are going to be decided in the next few years, and we can't lose sight of that uh, even while we debate these issues. Okay, Gayathri, you want to come yeah. in here? So I just wanted to point maybe two things. One is that I think it's inadequate to say that, well, the U.S. is having the debate who else is having the debate? What other mm. countries? I mean, other countries have not had debates about freedom of expression before. Why should this be uh, uh, an indicator that then the U.S. is doing better than the other? So I think I just want to make the point that I think it's inadequate to say that. Well, at least well, in I'm the U.S. Well, I'm not saying debate no, alone is enough. Yeah, I'm no, but I just want to say that enough, you know, think, because because this is a global a issue. Discussion. This is a global issue, mm. and I think that if you want to bring everyone aligned to the seriousness of the issue, it's also to say that you know the U.S. has the obligation and I think it is it is a responsibility to engage the others in that debate and force them into the debate because they are a beneficiary and they are a partner in the surveillance they are uh, that's one thing and I think the second is you are responding because there's civil society push there's a demand there's a strong demand and I think that that is really crucial in, in, in all of this without the media reports without the civil society pushing for all of these things maybe you know, you wouldn't have responded. So I think that's also very important, and it's something that I think a lot of us here are trying to get civil society in, in, in other countries to also demand for that. But I think that's where the, the gap but, is. But, but let, me, let me make one point. I mean, we don't stay, I don't stay away, we don't stay away from forums like this and forums around the world because we do want to have that discussion. This is not, you know, I'm not closing the door to any of these sure. discussions. But I'm I not a government. I'm not time. a government, and we need the governments And it's here. not just the yeah. governments we talk to. We do talk to governments, but sure. we also talk to civil society. Which, which is commendable, which is commendable, and I guess that's, this is the space to have these discussions, as, as you said, as we start to work on these issues. Nandira, what are your thoughts on the fact that somebody, you know, did mention governments have come into this late? This wasn't your ball game. You guys came in, uh, you know, in the aftermath, and, and all of a sudden, you're trying to take over. Uh, do, do you agree with that view, and what do you think should be the next steps? It's, um, it's a tough one. Um, I, I, I mean, I will refer back to my context, where, in a way, the government did pave the way, you know, for the facility to get there. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, they were first player. But when it comes to the actual governance and the actual issue of how the internet was used, the users were the first in that space. And in a way, there's that sense of ownership. And I can speak from my country and say um, that people may not feel like they own land in the country, but they feel like they own the internet. And so um, it's going to be very telling in the next couple of years, actually, in Kenya, um, how um, the citizens fight back and push back from the fact that the government wants to surveil, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like it's a daunting thing now, gaining strength from the neighboring countries and how they're dealing with this menace. Um, but yes, um, right now it's all, all a matter of how do we make sure, and I think for Kenyans it's an example, it will be an example they set for their sisters and brothers 
on how to actually address the issue. Um, where you tell the government, look, this is where we're saying we're coming together and negotiating as citizens. And if we're able to do that online, I think it will translate to so many other problems we have offline. So he has a point, but at the same time, um, if they are the ones who get the, ca the cables um, there, I don't know if who comes first, chicken egg. <laughs> you know? right. One of our participants, Andre, said, look, you know, I might come under attack for saying this, but we need surveillance, right? The question is, how do we build the trust? What are your thoughts on that? Why do we need to build a trust to secret services? To me, as, as a journalist, to be frank, it's, a, it's a quite a strange idea, because the whole idea of journalism is to check security services and other government institutions and to understand what's going on inside. We don't need, I don't, I, to be frank, it's, um, well, I don't quite understand how you can trust well, the FSB and how we treat Edward Snowden, for example. Maybe, I need to get information about, about right, what's going on. Maybe not with journalists, but I guess, he, did you mean build the trust generally with users and the public? I mean, for you as a journalist, I guess it's... As far as I understand, the idea is how to, because we need to, the idea of security services in the world, I think the first time this idea was uh, suggested by some British officials, is that... Um, before this scandal was Snowden, we presumed that, say, American intelligence services or British intelligence services in this part of the world, we have the right to conduct surveillance because um, it's mostly for good, and we should trust them that it's mostly for good. Well, actually, for me, it's, again, it's a, it's a bit of strange of idea because in my country, I don't think, and I think also for, for other countries, and especially in the developing world, uh, the idea that we might trust our secret services seems to be extremely, well, exotic. <laughs> and I think it, it's so the same goes uh, to the West. <laughs> so it's not going to happen. The trust will not grow. And this is therefore a healthy environment. Is, 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 is that what... Well, I think the democracy, it's, about, it's not about trust. It's about check and balances. Right, mm. right, right. Thank you. I think you, the question well, has been uh, addressed. Let me come to you now. Back to you, Tay Tay. In your environment, what are the urgent... And we're coming soon to the close of this session. What would you want from sessions like this? What do you need to happen on the ground? We talk about talking mm -hmm. in, 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 mm -hmm. in a lot of these forums and conferences. What do you need to see changing and what kind of cooperation do you need to, in place to make a difference in, in your country, in Myanmar? Well, um, um, I would really uh, well, would like to uh, take the, um, um, of course, the, not only the intangible results, but the tangible results that, you know, could, could that um, that led the uh, the people in developing country like us to actually hold of it and get access to connectivity and internet. So that's actually what we want. So ac access is the, yes. is the key thing mm -hmm. right now. And mm -hmm. okay, um, I want to come to the digital curators in just a moment for more comments. But first, I want to take maybe three more questions from the floor. If I could have you, there's a gentleman right here at the front. There's a lady there in a pink sweater. Anyone at the back? Not at the moment. Uh, please go ahead. Hi, Ihab yeah, Osman from Sudan, and I'm unfortunately I'm going to talk about Mr. Snowden again. So clearly, you you've said that there has been an ongoing discussion in the United States and elsewhere, and there are considerable changes happening to the way we collect data, we manage data, and we look at data, and that discussion will continue. So there are things that needed to be fixed. So what did he do wrong? Why is still he's considered a traitor or um, if, it's, uh, if it's basically he's someone who pointed out to issues in the, in the system and based on, on his revelations, a lot of changes happened into the system and will continue to happen for a long time. So what did he do wrong? Simple, simple question. We'll come to you there. Please. Thank you. My name is Rasha Abdullah. I'm a professor of mass communication at the American University in Cairo. I'm kind of very concerned by the general feeling that we're getting that mass surveillance is there and it's there to stay and it's necessary and just deal with it. I, I don't think um, we've had proper justification as to why it's that necessary uh, to be carried out on that level. Uh, we're talking about surveying private communications for millions of individuals. And as a media scholar, I haven't, I haven't seen anything that convinced me that it's really necessary for it to happen on that level, other than the protection of 
governments, the protection of regimes, not the protection of people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so let's take those two questions. Chris, what, what, did, what did Snowden do? So, look, I, I don't subscribe to the fact that, that someone who discloses classified information that could have wide-ranging effects on lives and safety, uh, you know, I think that's, that's still a crime, frankly. And, and I think that the debate, as I said, the debate in the last year, I think, has been a good debate. It's a debate we should have. It's a debate we'll continue to have. And, and I'll leave it at that. On the, on the, the second do you question... Think, do, do you think, though, at any point in, in a few years to come, that that perspective might change? Again, I, I will leave it... Uh, you won't, you won't I, even uh, comment uh, on that. I, but, I, you know, I think it clearly uh, there was a clear uh, disclosure of classified information and breaking the law, and that's just the fact. Uh, so, you know, the debate is something we, we should and we are having. Uh, and as I said, uh, there have been some, some real milestones in that debate. Uh, on, on the question of whether surveillance is needed, I mean, I think uh, the fact is every country in the world does some level of surveillance. They did it before the Internet existed. They will continue to do it. And if they're doing it for the proper purposes, which is a key thing and one of the things that Secretary Kerry talked about, those proper purposes do not include suppressing dissent of their, of their citizens, it, it, they, but they do include protecting those citizens. So it's important for them to be guided by certain overarching principles. Carl talked about what's happening here in Sweden, and those really are all linked to the rule of law, but they're linked to legitimate purposes, and the legitimate purposes is not to target those kind of dissidents and not to target religious and other beliefs. Uh, they shouldn't be arbitrary, and we do it for those particular purposes. Uh, and that there is a proper oversight and transparency. All those things is what you see shared in many of the systems around the world for democratic societies. That's where we have to go. We have to make sure there, there are appropriate safeguards in place, understanding that all countries have a duty to also to protect not, their, just not only their citizens, but often uh, other citizens of other countries and share that information. Great. I've been told that we've been given another 15 minutes. Great. I see a hand there. If the mic could come to the gentleman here at the front. There's a lady there on the side. Um, Hi there. Ahead, this was about, I'm Malavika from the Berkman Center at Harvard. Um, I had a quick question to Chris. Um, you talked about other countries not necessarily having a robust debate about surveillance. Could it be because they're not the countries actually conducting it on other citizens? No, I mean, no. <laughs> look, at, look at a lot of the repressive regimes out there who are doing a hell of a lot of surveillance on their own citizens and targeting those citizens and coming up with laws. And you've heard about them, some of those in the last couple of days. And they're not debating how they, you know, the, protecting their citizens. They're working at uh, further restricting their views. So that's, that's a whole different uh, approach. Yes, thank you. The gentleman here at the front. Um, yes, in the checkered shirt. Thank you. Jesus Robles from Mexico. Last December, a Homeland Security uh, official in Mexican embassy shut down a web page called onedmx.org where I uh, have written and uh, six or more people have uh, written articles about our uh, position uh, of Mexican government, a dissident position and with the help of uh, this uh, Homeland Security, GoDaddy shut down our page. Uh, three months later, GoDaddy, uh, when we decided to make it public, GoDaddy uh, this blocked this page. And uh, we, uh, since that, we have asked uh, uh, the government of our government, Mexico, and the uh, U.S. government for an explanation and. Uh, we have uh, never uh, had that, this explanation. So I want you, Chris, uh, thank you for being here. And if you have some information that could give me or make the uh, compromise uh, before these people to give uh, some information for the, for the users of Internet in Mexico, if uh, Homeland Security officers in the embassy collaborate to censorship a Mexican web page. I, I would like I'll, to know. I'll bring that to Chris in a moment. It will be a long shot if you get a specific answer from him, but we'll try. Um, let's get another two and, and then, yes. Yes, um, I, so I apologize for belaboring this point, but I'm sitting with a lot of people who are feeling unsatisfied by the US's answers on this question. And so I'm going to ask it a little bit differently and say that, okay, yes, we've had a wonderful, lively, robust debate in the past year, I agree. But isn't that debate only possible because of Edward Snowden and Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras and all of the other people who have 
done that. They're not here. They're not welcome. Thank you. There was, yes, go ahead, please. Um, I think many people have pointed out the, the issue of mass surveillance and why governments have to monitor each and every person. Um, I, I think in, in actual society, you, I mean, you always use the criminality or cybercrime as a justification for monitoring everyone, but you wouldn't put a camera behind everyone's shoulder uh, as they were going by the street to, to kind of say, tomorrow you might do, do crime and then we'll re go back to the information that you had or whatever you were doing yesterday. So we, we really need to know why not say we, we will identify people that are potential criminals and we'll watch them and we'll hold data for these people instead of kind of saying how, we'll monitor How will you everybody. identify them? Use some kind of... Uh, uh, the same way they, they identify uh, now criminals in, in, in the streets or crime industry. Or but wouldn't that in itself be some kind of discrimination? Wouldn't that in itself be profiling of some sort? But then you say it's fine for everyone to be profiled in this... Uh, uh, okay, I'd rather be with everyone else than on a list of possible potential criminals. But I'll put that. I'll put that. I'll put that to the panel. I'll put that to the panel. Um, uh, Chris, I'll come back to you first, just because. Look, I, come back you know, to I'd say I'd, I'd say we clearly have had within these two days and during this panel uh, a strong debate on this, and we'll continue to have it. And I don't think there's. I, I don't see any wanting of voices around the room who can express their views and discuss these issues. And that's good, and that's something that you know, I, I want to engage with those folks, and so that, that's fine. Uh, but, but I also would say you know, this idea that everyone is being surveilled for all purposes, that's, that's not, you know, it, it was clear that one of the things our president said is, again, you know, proper purpose, not targeting citizens uh, arbitrarily. That, that's one of the, the watchwords we have. And then th what, I, what I worry about, quite frankly, and th as robust as the debate is, I go back to what I said in the beginning, that if this is the only debate we're having, and we allow uh, other regimes to use this debate to control the internet more, to create those kind of structures. Uh, you know, five years from now, we're going to be at this forum and wonder what happened. So we, 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 you know, we cannot have just this debate. We have to have the debate that we had in that Mondial. We have to make sure that we preserve that kind of multi-stakeholder system and build it and strengthen it. You've been asked a specific question on Mexico. I, I have no information on that. Okay, well, I don't. I don't. I mean, uh, and, and I think your question has been answered. I think he said targeted surveillance, so maybe it's already happening, actually. Let's come to the panel now on, on, on some of the other issues. The question has been raised, why are we almost accepting this idea of mass surveillance being necessary? Um, you know, uh, Nanjira. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> it's, I don't know. I mean, like, oh, wow. Um, it's almost being passed off as um, a necessity now. Like, this the state can only protect you if it surveils all of you because the criminals are among you. Um, and it's been a very disturbing sense of um, trend to see. And it could be argued that in some cases, destabilization has been fronted for that particular purpose. And so, um, man, I think power is really corrupting. Um, and if we don't, pu if we don't push back, um, our hairs will be counted for us very soon. What are your thoughts on this? Um, I think that the reason why there's not that much uproar from some parts of the world is because um, I think there is actually a maybe several tiers of people who have even information about what's going on. And I, I bring this up because, again, you know, I wish that there was actually a far more uh, media coverage of the issue in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, you, we have a lot of other concerns as well, but it's actually not within the, within the radar. So I think even, and this was actually a point raised, I think precisely by Renata yesterday, that, you know, when you talk about communities of people who are aware of this, even that has kind of a hierarchy. Some yeah. have more information than the others. And I think it's the same thing with the media. It's a very big media event in terms of the, the revelations. Unfortunately, it's not taken the same um, intensity, maybe in Southeast Asia, and which is why I think that there seems to be a kind of quiet about the mass events. But I think if, if we actually talk to people, this is something that you know, we want to refuse. We even don't want CCTV cameras, for example, you know, mm. because clearly it's, it's not going to do any help. Uh, it's not going to help. So yeah. I do think that there's actually a lot of, um, uh, we are opposed to mass surveillance. Uh, but we are not putting it up enough in terms of uh, people's awareness, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think there's actually a gap where media is concerned. So I wish that there was actually far more debates going on within the media 
uh, to have access to some of these actually concerns uh, being taken into those uh, spaces. Right. I was going to just add the word context. Um, I think the conversation has just not been contextualized enough beyond um, the global you know, space. And so journalists or media or civil society in different contexts need to show the implications of these revelations in different countries, in different regions, for this to then uh, uh, you know, raise Why awareness. Why does it matter to Why should it matter to me? I already have enough problems. Right. But hey, make it count and probably will. Andre, from well, a media perfect, perspective. I think it's not about, it's not because of lack of information. Mm -hmm. um, well, just personal example. Um, last fall, I broke a story in The Guardian about the surveillance in Sochi. Uh, at the Olympic Games. And one of the issues was uh, that the government wanted to collect metadata on all participants of the Games, including judges, athletes, and journalists, for three years after the Games. And to be frank, the problem was that this information was, uh, in, well, debated in the West because many Westerners wanted to, go, to come to the Olympics, but it was not an issue in Russia. Everybody accepted this because of, uh, of some fears, because we were so concerned with security, because there were, there were so many reports of the coming terrorist attacks in Sochi, and people just accepted that. And so it's something about the level of, of debate in the society. It's not about well, immediate lack of information. Right, Tete, you're, you're very er in the very early stages still in Myanmar, but what are the views right now on this whole issue of mass surveillance? Well, uh, our, our government is kind of uh, infamous for doing this uh, mass surveillance offline before, mm -hmm. so, um, so we are very concerned that um, upcoming of the, this uh, uh, internet in the near future, um, this mass surveillance will be um, will, uh, uh, are the thing that we are, you know, very very concerned of. And also in our um, cultural expert and mindset, we've been like kind of like brainwashed that if you have done nothing wrong, then you have nothing to hide. Mm. Mindset in, in our culture. So I think that should be, you know, educate a lot on more privacy, for that. Yes, on, on the yeah. right to privacy. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Let's go to the digital curators for some questions, please. What do we have? Uh, yes, so we had a very vivid conversation on the internet and the internet says that they are very unhappy in general for uh, different um, uh, standards for US citizens and foreign citizens. But uh, concretely, I have uh, two questions and I will ask uh, the two questions are uh, for the US representative. One is on checks and balances. Uh, journalists and whistleblowers uh, play an important role to keep surveillance under check why the U.S. government is punishing and persecuting uh, them like never before. And the second question is about a concrete case, the Sunsuneo case. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, the Sunsuneo case in Cuba, where massive personal data from Cuban and Spanish users was collected, stored, and monitored using this uh, Sunsuneo fake social network uh, to help uh, increase freedom of speech in Cuba, which is uh, for the person asking the questions, quite strange, uh, once she wants to understand why uh, massive uh, personal data collection and surveillance is good for freedom of speech in Cuba. Thank you. Chris, back to you. Uh, well, look, I, I'm just going to say again, I, I, what we did enunciate very clear principles of non-arbitrariness, of uh, oversight, and for proper purpose. I, I'm not going to comment on specific cases. Uh, and I, I do quite frankly think that uh, you know, the, de the debate has been happening in the U.S. Uh, people are not being punished for expressing their views. Uh, if they broke the law very specifically in specific cases, that's a different thing. And there are very high standards for that. Um, so um, what, I'd, what I'd say again is look at what's happen actually happening in the U.S. Look, for instance, at in one of the comments you just made, look at the Podesta report that came out that, that said, following the president saying that we wanted to look to uh, extend privacy protections to citizens are not just U.S. citizens, which was a significant statement. Uh, I don't, you know, that's not something, again, that, that we've said, and I don't think other governments have said before, but then the Podesta report made a recommendation to uh, extend some of the protections of the Privacy Act in the U.S. Uh, to foreign citizens. So we are keenly aware of these issues, uh, and, and, it's, and it's important that we're aware, and it's important we're having this debate, and we should. Uh, but we also have to make sure that we, we maintain some of the core values going forward that we all have in common, uh, that we can have debates like this, that we can have civil society in the private sector being parts not just of the U.S., but of governments around the world. Let, let's address the Cuba question. 
Again, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna comment on any specific cases that are out there, and I, I don't have all the details on all these cases anyway. Okay, but but it's been noted, and and we hope we hope you take back with you that you have had uh, the, the, the Mexico uh, question and the Cuba question as well addressed to you. Um, we literally have the last few minutes, and I want to get your ideas on way forward as we wind up from each of our panelists. Um, so you've spent the last few days here. We've had a lot of discussions, and so my question is: so what? So what next? Let me start with you. Um, again, I think coming from uh, the media's perspective, and probably, um, you know, I, I do have to say that I appreciate that I was part of the quota that managed to come here. Uh, I did offer uh, Snowden my seat, uh, but he didn't respond, so I was not very happy about that. But uh, <laughs> no, I'm very appreciative that you know we we are included in this discussion because I think that. Um, we do have the opportunity to then also share uh, some of the things that we've, we've learned here. Um, I will say that uh, in the discussions about building communities, I would seriously um, you know, uh, suggest bringing in the media as one of the communities, uh, one of the partners in that communities uh, to, to actually uh, look at the issues of surveillance and, and, and make them part of uh, of, of that discussions as well, and I specifically refer to you know uh, the regions that are kind of at the moment outside, but are living in countries where surveillance is really big and and you know it is controlled by uh, surveillance tools from from the west. So I would really urge that uh, partnerships are formed with the media. Uh, there's the international consortium of uh, investigative journalists that are, that is a very good model, focusing on specific issues. Uh, but having collaborations not just across communities but across countries and and that would be my recommendation and I think the space is there for that to to be brought can I just make one last mm -hmm. point Chris again you know I think that it's really good that you know you're able here to to take the questions it's not a lot of governments that want to do that I just want to put on on on, on record you know when um, the answers about why Snowden is considered a criminal this is what governments in Southeast Asia do we don't arrest you for freedom of expression, but you broke the law. But the laws are wrong, they are unjust. So I just wanted you to know that, you know, I think it's insufficient. Thank you, thank you. Nancho? Um, I think my, my big takeaway is that um, other countries, other contexts have something to bring to the table. Um, you know, uh, we have these bodies of evidence and research to bring from our experiences mm -hmm. that may not align to how things are playing out in the West or everywhere else. And so I'm really excited, for instance, to have met with Tai Tai because we'll be doing the exact same work in Myanmar with them. And this is a South-South collaboration over the internet that has not had to go through this. This was just a great meeting point. And so I hope that it, even going forward, I don't know how much we have uh, in terms of a proportion of visionaries and implementers. I want to count myself as one of the implementers so that if I come back again, it's more and more bodies of evidence on how to do things in other contexts. That's excellent. So that, that is one of the successes of, of SIF 14 is the fact that the networking is <laughs> happening and, and it's great to see the South-South cooperation ongoing. Um, Andre? Uh, well, I think that this point about networking and sharing experience is ex extremely important. But as the same thing, we need to remember that not only activists and journalists share an experience, but also repressive governments and repressive regimes. And I should say that in, in my country, uh, the system of internet filtering was presented uh, uh, as a some sort of, uh, and, and the British example was put on the table, and uh, the Russian authorities referred to the British. When we got this bloggers law that now every blogger with uh, more than 3,000 followers should be registered, uh, Vladimir Putin personally referred to the United States and Germany and said, well, we have the same thing. And it goes not only about, it's not, it goes not only to legislation, but also about, it's also about uh, telecommunication uh, equipment and surveillance equipments. And here we need to remember that it's not only about Western governments and Western companies uh, exporting surveillance technologies to repressive regimes, but also about repressive regimes, which might be very good in producing surveillance technologies. And in this case, uh, well, it's even more market. Uh, just referring to this example about Mexico, you should remember that it's not only about uh, U.S. Uh, well, uh, surveillance technologies used in Mexico, but Russian technologies. Mm -hmm. Russian technologies are used now in Mexico to collect voice samples of millions of Mexicans. And, then, uh, and it was advised by Russian uh, company, which, uh, which uh, managed to, to sell the equipment to Mexico. And it happens everywhere, and we, we can go to China and to see the same thing. So we should remember that it it's all be, be became really global. Wow, powerful. 
Tai Tai, please, your thoughts. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I'm very optimistic and very encouraged to see, um, see all, this, um, all this work uh, being done by all these groups for the people who are going to be, the next billion of people who are going to, be come, to come online. Of, uh, online, because that's including most people from the developing countries. Mm -hmm. So I'm very optimistic about it. And also, uh, I really think that this, this kind of dialogue and uh, and uh, these discussions uh, and things on internet and digital inclusion should not only be discussed in uh, meetings like IGF or this SIF, but also in uh, high-level meetings uh, that that has the presence of the governments from the from the developing country also. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Chris. So first, I would just point out there's a huge difference between laws that target dissidents because of their dissenting views and court systems that are transparent and, and uh, obey the rule of law and, and actually have procedures where people get a fair right to trial. So, so I sort of reject that, that, uh, that comparison. But I would say, more generally, I, you know, I think, although this has been an important discussion, we've had a lot of discussion over the last two days, which I think has been very, very important coming out of Net Monday All and coming out of the Freedom Online Coalition. Uh, and there's been a lot of momentum, quite frankly, out of that. The title of this conference, which we haven't really touched on a whole lot during this panel, unfortunately, is Internet Freedom for Global Development. And how can we get this resource to the rest of the world? How can we make sure that we're doing the kind of capacity building and institution building and, and rule of law building around the world to, to enable this? How can we get more people uh, on the net and more people involved in governance uh, to really strengthen the governance system we have now so it's a more governments are participating, because they have a role to be sure, uh, but civil society and more uh, industry, indigenous industry from countries around the world, including the Global South, are participating. That was the great success of Net Monday All, is getting the Global South involved in that conversation. And, and I really don't want to lose that momentum. I really think that's important. In the last few minutes, I'd like um, to take from the floor uh, just a few thoughts, no questions, um, just a few thoughts in your own space what do you take away with you and what are you going to do in your space in order to ensure that you are growing the freedoms on the internet or ensuring that you're using what you do for development um if we could have some quest um, some hands up yes please go ahead the gentleman there well i gotta say i was a little disappointed with this conference you talked about uh what was it revolutionary ideas i can't remember I haven't heard any, and so one of the things I'm going to do is go back and think, we have a bankrupt model and a bankrupt discussion of this multi-stakeholder world. How many people in the room were playing multi-stakeholder bingo, where every time somebody said it, you, that's how ridiculous it's become. So what I'm going to do is go back and see, is there a way to get a more honest debate and one that really has some new thoughts? Do you, think, do you think it's an, a dishonest debate or do you think people don't quite have the answers? Why don't I ask Andre that? Because Andre is writing a book about uh, surveillance and he brought it up at the end. Uh, what will the internet look like if we have a Russian dominated internet? What will it be like? Will people in the room be happy? Will they have any voice at all? And yes, there is a good chance that we'll succeed and we have not done anything here to block that. Thank you for that. Let's see more hands, please. In your space, what can you do? Nobody else is doing anything in their space. Lady here at the front, please. Right at the front, just, yes. Thank you. There are two hands up there, I think. No, okay. Lady in the glasses, thank you. Yeah, my name is Jahan, I'm from Pakistan. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we need to do, we talked earlier about uh, educating the judiciary and uh, all that, but I think even more important is educating parliamentarians and legislators because uh, from our platform at Bolo B, we have done that. We have engaged with parliamentarians who did not understand why we were asking for uh, freedom of expression, why we were asking uh, to be for open internet. And yet, after we had sat down and talked to them, engaged with them one-on-one, -on -one, rather than bring it up in a room full of people, they have actually taken up the issue at the parliament level, they've taken it up at the Senate level, and actually addressed some of our issues. So I think sometimes it also boils down to educating parliamentarians. Some of them will never listen. 
but there will be others who will. So I think that's something that we will continue to do. But what is scary, in, you know, it's all right for all of us to get together once a year or many times a year, some of you meet at various conferences and talk about these issues of freedom of expression and surveillance. But more and more, we have begun to see in Pakistan that uh, citizens and young people are beginning to believe that surveillance actually is necessary. Mm -hmm. And this is something that government, security agencies, uh, people have managed to convince them that this is for your own good. Mm -hmm. So that is very scary because it doesn't matter in the long term what we believe because we're a small number of people. Mm -hmm. If democracy is what everybody believes in and most of the population thinks that it's okay to carry out surveillance, then they will allow the government to do so. Thank you very much for that. The lady in the, I think a black jumper. Yes. Please back, thank you. My name's, is that on? Yeah. My name's Jodie Ginsberg. I'm the CEO of Index on Censorship. We've heard certain names repeatedly for the last two and a half days, and I'm not going to repeat them again. Um, and one of the things that I found slightly disappointing about this conference is that we haven't heard other names in relation to internet freedom, people who've been arrested, detained, tortured, um, and punished for exercising their internet freedom. So one of the things I'm going to do is go out and work doubly hard to make sure those kinds of people, the Zone 9 blogger, Ethiopian bloggers and others, um, have a much greater voice in, in organizations and institutions like these. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. I think, you know, we end, do we have one more? We will take one more if we do. There's a lady here at the front. Could we have a mic at the front, please? Do you have somewhere, someone at the back? No? There's a lady at the front. You, you will get the final word on this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Beryl Aidi. I work with Kenya Human Rights Commission. Um, in my space, I think uh, what I'll do is what I've already started doing, which is uh, bridging the digital divide between uh, those who know um, and those who don't know and uh, even that knowledge gap. Um, and so started reaching out to grassroots um, human rights um, communities that uh, have no idea that these debates are going on. And uh, we'd like to leverage the power of uh, numbers uh, by enlightening them and then also bringing them to the table together with uh, the state actors that act at the national level. Thank you. Thank you, so that they have their voices heard <coughs> exactly. as well. Th thank you all so much. I think, you know, th the most important thing at the end of the day is what you take away from this conference. And for those that come and say, you know, we meet once a year, what's the big deal, you know? It's up to you what the big deal is. It's up to you what you take back with you and, and how you use that to shape the discussions, the dialogues, to lobby governments and to have these conversations in the limelight. Let's give our panel a big hand, please. Thank you very thank much. You. I particularly want to say thank you to Chris for the barrage, for taking it with grace, and please take the conversations to the US government. Um, and, and for all of you as well, I wish you all the best in all your endeavors. It's a, it's a, it's a dynamic space, it's an exciting space, it's a, it's a frightening space in some, in some ways, but we have the challenge because of the knowledge to do what we can. Um, God bless you, get, get home well, all of you, thank you. <laughs>